night may be long and the dark may be deep, but the answers are there to be found. Whether it's the normal, the abnormal, or the paranormal, you're in the right place. Let's go beyond reality. It's Tuesday night as we get ready to have a great discussion. Now, it's not the discussion that you may have been prepared for because we had a last-minute schedule change. Instead of talking about snakes tonight, which this actually may relieve a lot of people, but instead of talking about snakes tonight, we're going to be talking with our good friend and phenomenal paranormal researcher, Joshua P. Warren. He is a regular on the program. He's got some new things to talk about. These are a, a kind of a departure from what we've spoken to him about in the past. We're going to be talking about invisibility, invisible beings, technology, and the hidden worlds all around us, and how we can actually use it to our advantage. It's going to be an interesting discussion tonight with Joshua, and I look forward to having it, and I'm really excited about it. A couple things I need you to do, and I ask you to do this every night, but please do it if you haven't. Go to YouTube. If you're listening to the show as our podcast um, version of the show, please go to YouTube and subscribe to the YouTube channel. Just search for J.V. Johnson. You'll find it there. It's very simple to find. Subscribe. It's free, and you'll be part of our YouTube community where we have, I think there's about 500 back episodes on the YouTube channel, plus some special content. That's where you can find Booze, Brews, and Bros. And uh, what else is there? I don't know. Just, it's, it's just a great opportunity. Oh, we've got the chat room there when we're live. When we stream live, that's where it is. So uh, great stuff there. You go to YouTube, search for J.V. Johnson. And, of course, if you are watching or listening on YouTube to this show, we all we encourage you to do the opposite. Find the show on the podcast platform of your choice. We're on Apple Podcasts, Google Podcasts, uh, Spotify, um, there's a, a platform called Anchor, uh, and many others, uh, probably uh, all of them. But just go to that podcast platform and search for Beyond Reality Paranormal, and you'll find the podcast version of the show. And uh, subscribe to it for us. Get your name, uh, you know, get on the list there. It'll be That way the show will be automatically downloaded to your smart device. And if you miss an episode on YouTube, that'll give you an opportunity to catch up. They're edited down. Uh, they're a little bit shorter on the podcast version because we edit them down, take out the breaks and all that stuff. So great way to listen to the show. Any way you do is always is fine with us. So we appreciate all of that. All right, we're going to go to break, and when we come back, we'll bring our guest in. Again, tonight we're talking with Joshua P. Warren. We're talking about invisibility, tech, and the hidden worlds all around us right here on Beyond Reality. Don't go away. Please support the program. Go to patreon.com slash Johaw. That's J-O-H-A-W. Welcome back to the program. It's Beyond Reality, and I'm your host, J.V. Johnson. Thanks for being with us tonight. As I said, a quick shifter, shifteroo knee or whatever word I want to come up with here. Makeup is a better uh, way to describe it. But we've got a great uh, change in the schedule actually works really well in our in our favor here tonight we're not talking about snakes as we had originally scheduled in fact we've got one of our uh, uh good friends and one of our favorite guests joshua p warren joining us tonight he's got some new stuff that's kind of breaking it's kind of on the cutting edge here kind of uh hot off the presses if you will josh welcome back to beyond reality it's great to have you with us tonight Hey, thank you, JV. Always wonderful to talk to you, and we get into a lot of strange topics, so I think uh, we're going to cover cover some ground tonight. We really <laughs> do, and that's one of the things that's so much fun about having you on the program, is that when we set it up, I'm never quite sure where we're going to go with it, um, and tonight is no exception. I mean, when, when uh, Slick Eddie told me uh, the topics that you wanted to discuss, and I'm like, wow, this is great stuff, and I didn't even realize that you were working on some of these things. Well, you know, I've been a professional paranormal investigator and experimenter for 27 years, and I'm a big fan of that great quote by Charles Fort that you can measure a circle beginning anywhere. And when it comes to ghosts, UFOs, aliens, cryptids, people always say the same kinds of things. Well, it was there, and then it disappeared. It was visible, and then it became invisible. And you wonder, well, where did it go? What is this property that separates these uh, visible experiences from this realm that they sort of vanish into? And, of course, I'm joining you from Las Vegas, Nevada, and this state is owned, or let me put it this way, more land in this state is owned by the U.S. federal government than any other state, 86%. And so, uh, as a matter of fact, there's even what they call the Nevada Triangle, 
which goes from Las Vegas to Reno to Fresno, California. And believe it or not, there have been more disappearances here than there have in the Bermuda Triangle. Wow. Uh, over, yeah, over the past 60 years, an average of three planes a month have vanished here. Even the famed aviator Steve Fawcett in 2007 vanished flying through here. And what's weird is that, you know, you have... Um, you don't have a lot of vegetation. It's pretty barren here. Right. You have all this major, like, government technology scanning the skies. Where are people going? How are they disappearing? And I think that, you know, you can call, call me crazy if I tell you that I believe the government is studying paranormal phenomena because they're interested in, in invisibility. But then uh, if I say, well, they're studying it because they're interested in camouflage, oh, well, that makes sense. And you see, it's the same thing. Right. Uh, invisibility is camouflage. And so I think right now I'm in a place where I'm seeing some technology being developed that relates to how we understand the relationship between visible and invisible paranormal manifestations. This is great stuff. And before we get into the weeds, if you will, uh, something you said in your lead up uh, kind of caught my ear. And you were talking about the fact that uh, whether it's ghosts, whether it's Bigfoot, whether it's aliens, regardless of the paranormal phenomena, what's the common thread here? You see it and then all of a sudden you don't see it. Or sometimes, you know, it's just elusive to begin with and then you'll get a glimpse of something. Um, do you think, Josh, that there is a common source for all of these different phenomena? Well, uh, there is certainly um, the element of time that ties them all together. So, for example, when someone sees a ghost, usually this ghost it has some connection to the past. Now, granted, there are ghosts from the future and the present, and these, I mean, those are more obscure. I wrote about those in one of my books called How to Hunt Ghosts. But usually when someone is seeing a ghost, they're seeing something from the past, sometimes even an entire environment from the past. Uh, when someone sees a, a UFO, often time will stop. They, they talk about missing time. You have the old, old story about, you know, the guy in his pickup truck in Texas on a Wednesday night at 10 p.m., and the UFO appears, and his truck stops, and then the UFO flies away, and the truck starts working again. He doesn't have to turn the ignition. It's like the time itself stopped. Or people talking about following a cryptid like Bigfoot, and all of a sudden the tracks just stop in mid-path. Right. Well, where did he go? Well, we know that space and time are connected in this thing we call space-time. So his space has changed, therefore his time has changed. And so there is a space-time element here, which, and, and, which becomes very theoretical. But I don't think that that's really meaty for somebody in the military who's looking for a way to tap into this. I think what they have done is really study specifically how to take the visual element alone associated with these paranormal sort of transitions and turn them into technology that is possibly being used by extraterrestrials, but also being used by our own military. And in fact, I'm about to give you a very realistic demonstration of this, if you'd like. <laughs> sure. I always like that. Let's go for it. Okay, so 50 years ago, if I were to tell you I believe that we were surrounded by invisible beings, people, technology, you might have questioned my sanity. But today, let me show you how simple this is to demonstrate. Uh, I know that you're in front of a computer. Go, please, to my website, joshuapwarren.com. There's okay. no period after the P, joshuapwarren.com. Click the link that says Curiosity Shop, where I have all kinds of weird, unique items, and scroll to the bottom, okay. and you're going to see a 30-second video that I recently uploaded. Now, this is a video that I shot in my own home. Okay, that's how simple this is. I was able to attain a material which is known as an invisibility cloaking material. It's completely passive. It's not hooked up to any kind of a power supply. And what you'll see in this 30-second demonstration is that I could use many, many different objects. In this particular one, I just had a little tripod on hand, and I put the tripod down on uh, like a, a dinner tray, TV tray, 
and I put this material over top of it. And you will see this thing vanish when I put this material, it's a cylinder of this material over top of it, very, very simply. And I therefore said, I wonder what else I can do with this. And I can tell you, JV, that I have made myself invisible. I literally did an experiment where I put some of this material in the corner of a room. And yes, this is creepy. And I was able to sit there, and I'm a big guy, you know, I'm six foot two, 215 pounds. I was able to sit there and people would walk right by under normal lighting Mm -hmm. and would have no idea that they'd walk by me. Now, this is the kind of thing that I can do with a very simple, passive material. What do you think the military is doing with their enormous budgets? In fact, years ago, CNN did a very nice segment with a Pentagon correspondent saying, look, there is this company, it was called Hyperstealth. I haven't looked them up lately, but Hyperstealth was saying, We've got the Harry Potter cloak, basically. Like, you put this thing on, and people disappear. And so I'm not trying to make anybody any more paranoid than they already are. But what I'm saying is, let's open our minds here. We know that it's not very hard to be invisible. And so, therefore... You hear these stories about paranormal things that are invisible. Suddenly, they become more realistic. And just to give everybody a refresher on this real quick, so everything around you is basically a a pulsing vibration of electromagnetism or pressure. So that's why if you have on the low end radio, microwave, infrared, then we have this little section in the middle called the visible spectrum, which is what that tiny slice that you and I can see, and then it gets higher into ultraviolet, x-rays, and gamma rays. Now, human eyes can see that little section, Roy G. Biv, red, orange, yellow, green, blue, indigo, violet, which is about 400 to 700 nanometers. That's a billionth of a meter. It's a little, I mean, you can't even imagine how small that is. But some animals, like snakes, some fish, some frogs, they can see into the infrared, which is lower than we can see. Some animals, birds like penguins, bees, other insects can see into the ultraviolet, which is higher. Uh, Human ears can hear vibrations about 20 to 20,000 hertz. Dogs hear up to 45,000. Cats hear up to 64,000. So here we are, these very egocentric humans, and we think that our narrow little slice of perception somehow shows us everything that's worth knowing in the universe. And I'm telling you, it's, we're so dumb because it's, it's, it's easy. It's easy to fool our senses. And as a guy who lives here in Las Vegas and is friends with professional stage magicians, you can see how that opens your mind to what's actually out there that we just aren't always able to see all the time. I watched the video as you were talking, and by the way, I was a bit mesmerized by the video, so if I missed something yeah. you said, I forg- forgive me, but wow. Um, I mean, just wow. It, it, where, did you, where did you even discover this, and um, what made you start pursuing this particular line of thought? Because it's not something that would have occurred to me. Well, everything that I have done all these years has really been about understanding the peculiar relationship between matter and energy. So whether we're talking about, again, the typical ghosts, cryptids, UFOs, psychic phenomena, or things that are even more tangible, such as how is it that you take a coil of wire and a magnet and turn that into a flow of electricity. I mean, I'm always looking at how these things sort of, how, 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 how things transform or transduce from one state to another, physical to non-physical, and back, back and forth. And so, therefore, um, when I started, you know, looking at why do we have these sort of stories that are always talking about things that are there, and then boom, they disappear. I started talking to a lot of my friends who work within military circles. And what I discovered is that what I did, okay, what you see in that video is so rudimentary that to be 100% honest with you, 
I am a little bit concerned about saying exactly what that material is and exactly how I attained it, because think of how easily that could be misused and abused. Right. I mean, think what a criminal could do if the criminal could make him or herself invisible. Uh, what would happen, and I don't want to give anybody any ideas here, so again, I'm being very careful, but I mean, what if you could take something that was dangerous and make it invisible? You know what I mean? Yeah. So I, I don't want to say specifically what this material is, but what I can tell you is that was easy for me to attain in this particular position that I'm in, and it is nothing, nothing compared to what's out there. And so now, when you look at this, I have given you physical, absolute physical, undeniable proof that it's not as hard as we once thought to make something invisible, and so therefore, how far has this gone? And here in Las Vegas... I believe that I've even seen some UFOs that are exhibiting aspects of this technology, but I'm not sure if these are extraterrestrial or if I'm seeing stuff that's been created by our military or back-engineered by our military from extraterrestrial tech. And we can get into some specifics if you like, but you can see how this is... This is, this is something that could be very easily abused in the wrong hands. Let's talk a little bit about the military and how advanced they may or may not be. We, you know, we talk about theoretical, and I'll, I use theoretical, and in, in I'm doing air quotes as I say that. Uh, mm-hmm. We talk about this theoretical technology, whether it's invis- invisibility cloaking, or it's anti-gravity, or it's time travel. And you just demonstrate that in your own home, you can achieve something pretty amazing. In fact, something that we may not have considered possible. Yet we know that the military is working on secret projects that have to be, what, 30, 40, you know, 50 years ahead of where they say they are. I don't don't know what the number is. What do you think it is? And what texts do you think that they've already broken through the barrier on that we don't know of? We, at this point, are within a, a cycle, a resonance of technological innovation, the quickening, as some have called it, where things are developing so exponentially fast that it is truly impossible for us to imagine what you can do when you have billions or trillions of dollars at your disposal. And, of course, when, you, when, it, when, you, when it comes to like the, the black budget that the military gets, every year allotted in the overall U.S. federal budget. Even the amount of money is questionable. That's how secret this is. So there's no accountability for how much is being spent. And so, therefore, again, let's go back to, you know, every time you hear me say invisibility, think camouflage, camouflage. Yeah, of course. How much money do we spend on just camouflage stuff? Old-fashioned, let's paint up a guy's shirt and pants and hat and throw them out there in the jungle and hope nobody sees them. Well, think about how much better this is, where basically we're talking about no matter what environment you're in, if a pilot crashes, he can take out his blanket, his invisibility blanket, and put it over himself, and nobody will see that he's even there. He doesn't get captured. And I, here in um, Nevada, uh, 10 years ago, um, I guess it was, yeah, I think it was right at 10 years ago, I was in Laughlin which is about um, an hour and 20 minutes south of Las Vegas. And I looked up through third-generation night vision goggles, and I saw this huge, I mean, absolutely gigantic V-shaped craft that was silently gliding overhead. Now, when I took the night vision goggles down, I couldn't see anything. And uh, there were three other guys there with me who also had third-gen night vision. And so we were all, through the third-gen, able to see this big V-shape. And and it took it probably a minute and a half or two minutes to cross over the horizon going from, uh, well, it was from east to west, and ultimately kind of headed toward the direction of Nellis Air Force Base. Um, and 
that was a that was, was so eerie to see something that big and so silent, sort of floating over us like that, so slowly. And since then, I have talked to other people who have had more clear, close sightings of these craft. For example, there's a man named Sean Kevin Jason, who in 1996 had one of these things hovering practically. 20, maybe at the most, 20 feet over his head. Uh, and, I, and he actually took me out to the site where he had this encounter, which, by the way, happened to be where I also discovered a time anomaly in 2018. But anyway, my point is, the thing he saw was a big triangular-looking thing. And I told him, I said, well, what I saw didn't look like a triangle. It looked like a V-shape. And he said, yeah, but... It would look that way if they have this cloaking technology on the bottom of the craft so that all you're seeing are the stars above the craft, and that leading edge might be the only thing that's not perfectly camouflaged, and so it looks like a V-shape from my point of view. And if all of your listeners right now go do a search, go to Google and type in Telos, T-E-L-O-S. You will not find a lot of information. T-R-6 Telos. He said that this may be one of the things that I and other people have seen and described as a V-shape or a triangle that uses this cloaking technology. It's a big, black, V-shaped craft, and Telos stands for Trans-Atmospheric Electrogravitic Low Observability Surveillance Platform. Yeah, I know that's a mouthful, but, but basically what they're saying is that this is a thing which is using some type of innovative technology, uh, electromagnetic, maybe there's some anti-gravity, it's probably not even necessary, but the point is this thing is able to silently and slowly glide around and observe things, and unless you happen to be there with some night vision or you happen to see one of these things up close, it's, 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 it's not going to show up in the night sky because it's using this invisibility technology uh, that is so simple. It could be like the thing I used in my house, or it may be so advanced that you've got guards and secret service guys and you know craft all over the place every day that you just don't see. This stuff is fascinating to me because it, a lot of what you're saying is you just have to take a step back and start thinking about it differently. Um, and when you start to think about it differently and you start to consider some of the points that you've just brought up, it all starts to make a, 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 a more sense than it did prior, right? I mean, it all starts to come together in a way that there's some logic to it. And you think, ah, okay, now I'm starting to understand. Well, that's right, because you don't have to just jump straight to this. You, know, you don't have to make this giant leap. Like, for example, if I sit down and I tell you, I saw something that it was there and then it disappeared. And you say, well, what was it? And you say, I don't know, maybe it was a ghost. Maybe it was a, a UFO. Maybe it was an interdimensional being. Maybe it was, you know, I mean, I, I could go down this list of things, and people, like, roll their eyes and scratch their head because they haven't even gotten to the point where they even understand how easy it is for stuff to disappear and to become invisible without any kind of misdirection or any, anything like that. So you have to take this in baby steps. What I'm showing you right now is that if it is so easy to make stuff disappear, that I can, can give you this little demo, and I, I'm going to be shooting a bunch more illustrations. I mean, I can do, I actually went out and bought some like little ghost figures and some little Bigfoot figures and some <laughs> little flying stuff, just, nice. just for fun, you know? Yeah, yeah. I, I'm going to shoot some videos. If I can so easily make something disappear, if I can sit myself down in a corner and people walk by and have no idea that I'm sitting there, well, then this should show you that it's not that big of a deal for there to be invisible things around you. So let's say that conversation has become simplified now. So if we know that it's easy to create invisibility, well, then now that brings us one step closer to taking seriously what people are describing when they're seeing what they call paranormal phenomena 
that disappears. And when you compare that to that tiny slice of stuff that the average person can even see and hear to begin with, well, then why is it so hard to believe that we are immersed within a spiritual realm or a realm that includes other dimensions of life where we do have uh, UFOs and, and extraterrestrial beings that are more or less occupying space around us, but we don't even see them, and in some cases we might not even be able to physically feel them depending on the vibration that they're operating at. And so this is just another simple step in showing that relationship between the invisible and visible realities that should make it easier for us to, to take people seriously when they come forward and talk about having these encounters. And we can learn from that how to tap into these other realms and use them for beneficial purposes, which I know we're going to get into at some point on the show tonight. So that's the connection. I know it can be a little complicated, but it pretty much makes sense, right? Tonight we're talking with Joshua P. Warren, great friend of the program, excellent and uh, innovative paranormal researcher, has been doing it a long time. His website is his name, joshuapwarren.com. Many, many books to his credit. And we're talking about technology tonight. Are we surrounded by invisible beings and technology, whether it's the military, ET, or spirits? And how can we use this information to manifest whatever we want magically? That's what we're talking about tonight. And Josh, you've got a... How many books do you have now? I mean, I, I've lost count. I have two. Uh, you know, you've got it, more than two. It's over 20. It's over 20. I started oh, publishing lost. when I was a teenager. <laughs> And um, and I've published, you know, with some of the biggest publishers in the world, like Simon and Schuster. And then I published some stuff that I just like to keep uh, small uh, ebooks that I put out there, where I could I don't have to worry about an editor coming in and, and messing around with things. But uh, yeah, I've published a lot of fiction and nonfiction. And you've got uh, books that talk about the Brown Mountain Lights, talk about uh, learning how to ghost hunt, talk about uh, Asheville, because you you still live in Asheville part time. Part time, I do. Yeah, um, this past couple years, I've been spending more time here on the West Coast. I do a lot of work in the TV business, and so I was finding myself traveling out west all the time. And not to mention what's happening here with the UFO disclosure in Las Vegas. And so, yeah, I'm working on three different TV programs right now. Uh, two of them are going to air in the next month or two. I'm the executive producer on a third one. And so, uh, yeah, I mean, I, 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 I'm happy that. Everybody is so interested in this strange stuff right now, but it keeps me traveling a lot. Can you share any of the details on the television projects? Yeah, one that I'm really excited about is uh, it's called it's on the Discovery Channel called Rob Riggle Global Investigator, and Rob Riggle is a comedic actor. Uh, a lot of people know him from Saturday Night Live or the Hangover movie. I mean, he's been in a lot of different movies. And if you don't know his name, I guarantee you, if you look up his uh, name, you'll 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 know his picture, Rob Riggle. And he got this great gig at Discovery Channel, where he he shot the whole uh, season. It's going to debut on Sunday, March eighth, I believe. And he travels around exploring mysteries, but he is putting an entertaining, fun spin on it. So he's not going there and making fun of things, but he kind of plays the doofus like he's the butt of the joke. And the experts that he talked to are sort of educating him. And so at the same time, it's a very simple, entertaining way for the audience to, to kind of go on his adventure and get educated as well. And so uh, he came out here to Vegas, and we did a whole big UFO Area 51 show. Uh, I'll be all throughout that program. And, uh, in fact, um, Rob Riggle, you know, he, he he's a retired lieutenant colonel in the Marines who saw combat and everything. And so he's not just some goofball actor. I mean, the guy is actually very, very smart, and, um, and he has a, a lot of valuable insight 
when it comes to the UFOs and the military activity in this area that, that we're talking about. So that's one thing that's, that's uh, really cool. I'm not sure what the date will be of the episode that I'm going to be on, but I'm sure you'll be seeing a lot of advertising for uh, Rob Riggle, Global Investigator on Discovery Channel. Sounds fun. Sounds interesting for sure. I want to go back to this cloaking uh, camouflage technology that we were talking about in our first segment. It's easy to understand its a, uh, application when you're talking about maybe a, a UFO type sighting, um, some type of uh, military hardware that might be uh, partially or fully cloaked or camouflaged, if you will. But again, how do we transition this idea and this technology into our discussion about ghosts? Well, for one thing, I've always been intrigued by looking at the actual engineering questions that arise from how a ghost might materialize. So, in other words, um, everything requires a power supply. So I don't care if it's a UFO or it's a ghost. Something has to power it. And so that's why I've always been intrigued with these things that, you know, are luminous, that are radiating energy. People talk about being exposed to uh, sometimes harmful rays that come from these beings, like Mothman. They get uh, sunburn or, you know, like they've, they've been exposed to some UV of, of some kind. Uh, they their, their, their eyes become inflamed. Um, and, and you wonder, okay, well, if we're just talking about a spot outside or an empty room, let's just break this down as as an engineer, as a mathematician, scientifically, you know, where does this energy come from? Because if you can figure out where that energy comes from, then you might be able to tap into that energy and voila, now you have some kind of source of free energy, zero-point energy, you know, like something that's coming from the vacuum. That's one possibility. So it's very, very difficult, however, uh, and this is maybe a silly analogy, but it, but it, it will be very difficult to describe to a fish what air is, you know, if that fish has never been, right. you know, uh, near the near the surface of of the water, um, and so to me, when, when you start talking to people about any of these things that include the idea that there are beings, phenomena, technology that can be there and then vanish. That's the first hurdle you have to get over. How is that even possible? So whether or not. What I'm showing you in this little video is a direct demonstration of, of how that is actually happening in a paranormal encounter. It still shows that this is something that can be easily achieved, that light can be easily bent using a passive substance. And so if we are dealing with a much more complex encounter, well, then you shouldn't automatically sort of discount or disbelieve somebody because you can't make it past that hurdle. That is not the biggest challenge. So forget about, like, how could this thing be, be there and then disappear and be invisible and come back? That's the first obstacle that people have to overcome mentally before they take these things seriously. And so, yes, uh, like I say, if you can't explain... To, to a fish what this atmosphere is like um, so easily. It, it's similar to trying to explain to someone, uh, a, a human, uh, that there are other realms and dimensions and states of existence, uh, other media of existence in which these things might uh, perhaps primarily reside, and that we just sometimes get a glimpse of them. So are you saying here that uh, you've demonstrated a way 
that virtual in- invisibility or camouflaging can take place. Therefore, we shouldn't discount that it can happen in other ways uh, for maybe what we call ghosts or for what maybe what we call uh, Bigfoot creatures. Um, but you're not going to the point in saying that that those, let's talk about ghosts specifically, that ghosts aren't necessarily spiritual. You're just saying that, hey, if I can do this here, you can't discount that it's possible over here. Yeah, because when you start looking at the mystery of ghosts, for example, there are, you know, about a dozen big questions that come up. And this is one of them that we can kind of check off. Like, we may not know exactly how a ghost transitions from visible to invisible, but we can now say, look, this is way easier than you think it might be. Like, that's not, that shouldn't be a big problem in, in right. the discussion. And, and in fact, if you look at the world in general, you know, I, uh, speaking of my books, I wrote this book called Finding Your Magic. And, uh, of course, this May, I'm going to do an event here. This, it's very rare for me to do events because I can't really commit to live events because I have all these spontaneous opportunities that pop up to right. investigate places or do research or whatever, TV sto- shows and stuff. So, But I, I'm, I'm doing an event this May here in Vegas uh, based on this book called Finding Your Magic. And uh, one thing that I, I, I was looking through the book because I wrote it a couple years ago, and I wrote this, which I think is very... Um, uh, relevant to this conversation. If you ever doubt the power of magic, just look outside at the buildings, trees, hills, mountains, oceans, planets, and stars. Nothing is truly man-made. Humans only take the resources that were here and rearrange them. We struggle to understand how those resources were originally created because we must accept that an invisible power produced and holds all those things together. And that invisible power is magic. And so once we start opening our minds to the fact, and that, that was the end of the passage, but once we start opening our minds to the fact that there is an invisible structure, an invisible backdrop to this world that we are able to see and hear and touch and experience on a day-to-day basis, then you can actually take advantage of that and use it. It's hard to teach somebody how to swim if that person has never been in the water. And so once that person is able to realize that this other realm exists and you're able to demonstrate that it exists, what it shows you is that Going back to the basic concept here, the relationship between matter and energy, and not just how to be spooked when something spontaneously pops out of the ether and out of your closet at night or whatever, Uh, but you can you can you can tap into that, and you can use specific mental exercises in order to create a mold a mental mold in the non-physical world to which these physical particles will adhere, and that is how you can change your physical reality in order to do things that you otherwise think are impossible. So we can get as much into that as you want, but that is the relationship between ghosts, UFOs, cryptids, ESP, and other psychic phenomena, interdimensional beings, concepts of angels and demons, all that stuff, and how that you can take advantage of how those things relate to your life so that you can basically project some kind of a shape into those realms, which is when you start studying magic. And and the big problem, as we've talked about before, JV, is that you have people out there who've, and I'm not talking about, you know, witchcraft. I'm not talking about communing with some kind of spirit. I'm talking about your God-given creative ability. And there are people out there who maybe they've tried something and it didn't work. They tried using a wand and they said, well, that didn't work for me. Or they tried using a wishing machine. They said, I'm having trouble getting the stick. Or they tried dowsing or scry, and they just say, oh, this is all fooey because they get frustrated and they just give up. Well, what I did was come up with a personality test that people can take, 
It's a very simple one. You grade it yourself so nobody's getting into your business. And it actually connects you with one of 12 personality types. And that personality type gives you an idea of the most likely way that you can tap into a method or a technique with some practical exercises that will help you to start taking advantage of this principle. That, In other words, now that you know this exists, you can start learning how to make it beneficial. Now that you know the water exists, that's the first step in learning how to swim, and you have to take everything step by step. We uh, we have to go to break here in just a couple minutes, but I do want to explore this uh, even further, and uh, we have a lot more to talk about when it comes to that. But quickly, I want to ask you, as an aside, uh, the time anomaly that you found near Las Vegas, were you able to follow up? Any, any other work on that uh, that you can report to us? I have been there a number of times since then, and I have not gotten another anomaly. So oh. that shows you how lucky I was that day. But it also turns out that the military was doing some experiments nearby that day. So oh. I may have gotten doubly lucky with that. Wow. Okay. Well, that makes it even more interesting. Um, and, yeah. and, and I think I said at some point already in our discussion, technologies that the military may be advanced in, like... And I use time travel as one of those examples, so maybe there's something to that. Um, we're talking tonight with Joshua P. Warren, uh, paranormal researcher. We've got a lot more to discuss with him. But in the meantime, visit his website. It's just his name, jo- joshuapwarren.com. He's got many books to his credit. Josh, where are the books available? I know you've got information on your website, but where else are they? Well, you know, they're all over the place. Obviously, Amazon.com is a good one, but some I I really hold dear to my heart. I don't want an editor to go in and, and somebody who doesn't understand the complexities of the things I write about. And so some you can only get through JoshuaPWarren.com and go to the Curiosity Shop, and uh, you'll see all the all the options. And on the in the Curiosity Shop, but you told me to scroll down to the bottom to see the video that we talked about, uh, but you've got a bunch of other stuff there as well. There's a lot of stuff, and at the top, there's a PDF pack where you can uh, read like four, four or five of my books for $9.95 as instant downloads. I don't like just buying some crap out there and wholesale and marking it up and putting it on my website. You'll find that majority of the stuff that I have is unique, handmade, rare stuff, and it sells out a lot. I'm not Walmart, uh, but, I mean, I... I I really am concerned with the fact that I want people to buy something from my curiosity shop and say, this changed my life. And so I'm not going to sell you the cheapest stuff in the world, but I promise you, if you buy something and you don't love it, I'll give you your money back. And uh, that almost never happens. Some people are a little nutso, and they, they want to live forever like a vampire or fly like Superman, and sometimes it's kind of, it's kind of hard to, to ensure that. But if you're the type of person who wants to go there and, and work within the natural laws, you will find um, a lot of wonderful products. And also there's a lot of great content for educational stuff there for free as well. And one thing I've got to ask, because I, this topic comes up more and more frequently, and I'm, I'm seeing the topic come up in my notes when magic is spelled with a K, and I've been a little bit confused as to why all of a sudden the K. What's the significance of the K in the word magic? Well, you know, it was originally fe- uh, spelled with a K, um, but what happened is uh, over time... Uh, and I, I don't under, understand exactly how all the linguistics developed. Um, you had, of course, all of these illusionists, these entertainers, these stage magicians, who started dropping the K because they felt it was redundant, and they just called it, you know, magic with an M A G I C. And so, basically, using the K is a reinforcement of the fact that we're not talking about pulling rabbits out of hats. <laughs> um, that, you know, we're, we're talking about my definition of magic, which I think is pretty consistent with, with most realistic definitions. Magic is mentally projecting your intention to shape physical reality to your desires. And the great thing about understanding that, you know, you actually have the power to create real magic is that I can sit here 
and sound like I'm doing an infomercial and tell you, oh, yes, magic is real. But all you have to do is go to YouTube and just search the word cymatics, C-Y-M-A-T-I-C-S. Everybody has probably seen a cymatics video at some point. Yeah, we've talked about it. We've talked about it with you on this program a few times, sure. Yeah, where you 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 play a vibration. You know, you in the old days they did it by running a a fiddle bow down a thin piece of metal, or an, or, or you know, you, you you can do it with just playing a tone under water or sand, and you see all these amazing patterns, these very organized, structured patterns that that appear. And I think that's really just the most practical way of demonstrating what magic is. If you are able to envision that your brain is like that speaker uh, and you're producing that tone, then eventually you're going to create a structure, a mental mold, a non-physical mental mold that your physical reality will snap into. And, and that's really the long and the short of, of what magic actually is. When you talk about projecting your intentions or your desires and making them manifest, uh, is that have a tie to things that we discuss that may be astral projection or it may be uh, even types of uh, uh, lucid dreaming or this idea that there might be a matrix of consciousness that connects everyone? I think it's all of the above. Um, it, it really goes to the, I mean, I guess what it does is it illustrates that for some reason, many people out there feel like that they are pawns in their lives. They feel like that they are somehow these external pieces that are just basically victims uh, that are just reacting to whatever circumstances appear on a day-to-day basis. And there is some truth to, to to that scenario. I mean, that's why governments exist. I mean, governments are there to tell you, obey, 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 you know, right. do what we tell you to. And, it's, it, and we can't just demonize governments for that, because obviously you can't have chaos either. But what we found is that uh, some people, ha- they take it too far, and they and they feel like that they are just um, being, you know, brainwashed or whatever, and they and, and they just have to constantly struggle uh, to to react to whatever situation they have. But that's not that's not reality. You are an interactive participant. You are an interface, and you can actually change what's happening around you uh, to a certain extent. Uh, I call this lucid living. I mean, my my book, Finding Your Magic. Is, is subtitled How to Hack Reality Through Lucid Living. And I use that word lucid living because it's a lot like when you're having a dream. Um, I, I'm a very vivid dreamer. I mean, most of the time when you have a dream, you don't even know you're dreaming. But right. once in a while, you become aware of the fact that you're dreaming. And then you say, oh, I can have fun with this now. It's like I'm playing a big video game, and you can do all this cool stuff in your dream. Well, this thing that you call consciousness and awakeness and awareness is just another version of a dream. And you will be absolutely amazed at how much you can do in this dream state if you are given the tools and the guidance to become lucid, or at least more lucid. And so, you know, I mentioned earlier that everybody's different. You know, uh, us DNA-bearing creatures, we are all unique. And so it's easy for us to dismiss one approach or another just because, well, that didn't work for me. And so these 12 personality types that I came up with after my uh, test, uh, number one is the techno. And by the way, this is very interesting to me on a number of levels. You know, um, people often say, well, you have to believe and you have to have faith. You don't. That's that's completely wrong. <laughs> when you look at an optical illusion, like like you look at a picture of some circles and they look like they're spinning like wheels, well, you know they're not spinning. But they but it doesn't matter that you know they're not spinning. It's an optical illusion. There's what matters is perception. 
you have all these examples of people who take placebos and they know that it's a placebo and it still works. And that, so the techno thing, you know, like a lot of people think technology is God, but trust me, you know, we dig into that. Uh, for uh, the, the, the second type of personality is called a force bender or Jedi. The third is the prayer. That's the most popular form of manifestation, people who pray. Number four is the name seer. Number five is the spellcaster. Number six is the remote. Seven is the PK. Eight is the dowser. Nine is the psionic. Ten is the scepter. Eleven is the scryer. And twelve is the claro. And so basically what you do is you go through and you figure out what is actually going to work for me. And so even though, yes, you can go and you can get uh, this ebook and and actually right now I have a thing where you can get a wand with it and all other cool stuff at my website. This May, okay, May 29th and 30th, here in Las Vegas, I'm doing Finding Your Magic 2. There are 99 tickets total available. I we I don't even know how many are left at this point because I just announced this. I think literally yesterday, uh, and so. When I did this before, it sold out, so I'm sure it's going to sell out again, especially now uh, we're giving people a discount. And, and you know, JV, you produce big events, and so, I mean, when you put together an event, you want everybody to leave and say, that exceeded my expectations. Right. So, so that's what I'm doing here. I'm going to exceed expectations. Um, you're not only going to get educated in all this, but I've got some very special surprises, and you can learn all that stuff as well. Uh, if, if you're if you're in the Las Vegas area, I mean, I don't know why you wouldn't do this. Go to youwillmanifest.com, youwillmanifest.com, and learn about that because people contact me all the time, and they say, I did not know that I could do this. And when you showed me how to do it, it changed my life. And I have testimonials, and I have audio clips of testimonials, and I have emails of testimonials. And, and, and the funny thing is, you know, I'm self-employed. I've been self-employed since I was 18 years old. I could not remain employed, self-employed if I was selling people stuff that didn't work. So when I say, check this out, it works, I'm telling you, it works. You, uh, I, I want to make sure that everybody understands what you're talking about here. If if someone buys a ticket to this particular event, Finding Your Magic 2, they come, what are they going to expect to be able to walk away with? What are you going to show them how to well, do? Well, the first night, which is Friday, I mean, not only are we going to have <laughs> a big, fun gathering and party uh, at this place called Millennium Fandom, which is the number one cosplay bar in the world. So you're going to see a bunch of people dressed up in amazing costumes and movie props and movie replicas. You know, it's Vegas. But do you know that I am the owner of Art Bell's alien statue? Have we talked about that before? We, no, we have not talked about that. That is a crazy story because I, I know that surely you were just as inspired by by Art Bell Absolutely. and his work as, as I was. Absolutely. Yeah. yeah, and so Art Bell, and this is a very long story short, Art Bell, um, went, after his wife died, very she was young and it was very tragic, he remarried and his new wife and daughter were terrified because he had this four-foot-tall wooden alien statue, about 100 pounds, and they swore it was coming to life at night, and he had to get rid of it. And uh, Art had interviewed me a few times on his show, and so he contacted me and asked me if I would like to have this <laughs> alien. And at first, I didn't even believe this was real, okay? I thought this was a joke. But it was real, so I got, this is about 10 years ago, I got this alien, I put it in my Asheville Mystery Museum in, in North Carolina there, and it has been the, like the featured piece for, for 10 years. And of course, Art died a few years ago. That's right. Well, the Asheville Mystery Museum is in the basement of the Asheville Masonic Temple, and, for, and that building is 107 years old. And they are doing major, major structural renovations to that building. So basically, 
uh, within 30 days, I'm going to have to close my museum down because they're going to go down and pretty pretty much like gut the basement and everything. So I'm shipping a bunch of stuff here to Las Vegas. That first night, Art Bell's alien statue called Carvel is going to be here. And you know what? That statue was first given to Rush Limbaugh. Oh, wow. And Rush Limbaugh named him Carvel because he thought the alien looked like James Carvel, the Democratic pundit. And so that's where he got the name. Well, that's so hilarious. It first owned, yeah, it was first owned by Rush. Then Rush gave it to Art, and now I have this thing. So, whoa, 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 whoa. It was, yo, hold most, on. It was Art's, Art Bell's, and then he gave it to Rush, and Rush gave it back to Art, and then he gave it to you? Is that, is that how? No, no. What happened was there was this guy who uh, used to carve wooden statues mm -hmm. who listened to Rush Limbaugh's show. And okay. he decided he would carve an alien instead. And so he drove this statue to New York to Rush Limbaugh's office and dropped this thing off. And he oh. had no idea after that what journey it took, but I ended up interviewing that guy on my show. I have a podcast also called Joshua P. Warren Daily. Everybody's got a podcast, you know. I seem so. And, uh, <laughs> yeah. <laughs> But my, mine sometimes is only five minutes. I mean, I just kind of update people on what I do every day. You can find out about that at joshuapwarren.com. So anyway, this guy drops off the statue at, at Rush's office, and then Rush met Art at a convention and said, you deserve to have this, and gave Art the statue, and then Art's family freaked out, and so... I so it ended up being shipped from Nevada to North Carolina, where it's been for ten years, and now he's coming back home. Wow. So he's coming coming back to Nevada. How weird is that? I would have never imagined that that would happen. Well, you know, it's it's it is weird, and it, and also just the fact that we're talking about Rush Limbaugh tonight for a couple of reasons. One is Rush yesterday announced that he's got advanced stage lung cancer, which is a very sad bit of news and i had d done a little bit of an intro uh talking about rush regardless of where you stand politically when you're a broadcaster there are certain people that you look up to and rush limbaugh is at the top of that list um having single-handedly invented the modern radio talk show and uh, actually single-handedly saving am radio from the uh the scrap heap of history uh so he's quite an individual and he was honored tonight in the state of the union address which was very very appropriate so it's you know one of these synchronicities here that we're having this conversation tonight i i agree entirely yeah i mean and it's you know it's one of those things that uh i mean <laughs> I I could I could literally talk to you for an hour and tell you the full story of this alien statue. The big question, but, Josh, though the big question is his uh, Art Bell's second wife and daughter said that this statue was coming to life. Have you seen any yeah. indication that it does that? <laughs> okay, so when I first got this statue, um, I, I was traveling because I had uh, made a, a deal to appear on Ghost Adventures on the Travel Channel. And then I was, and that, which we were filming um, north of San Francisco at the Winchester house. And they, they closed the whole mansion down for a couple days just for us to shoot. And then I had to fly from there to Sault Ste. Marie, Michigan for the Michigan Paracon. So I like had this ridiculous schedule. And it was in the middle of this when I got the word that Art said, like, this has got to go. You know, this has got to go. And so I actually, I, 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 I'll kick myself to the day I die. I was unable to go to Art's uh, estate in Pahrump and pick this thing up. Uh, just because I had these obligations. But I had a friend who was a big fan, and he went to Art Bell's house. And Art was just such a great host and just invited him in, and they sat around and, you know, all anxiety. And I mean, it was like, ugh. It, it depresses me to think about me missing out on this experience. Yeah. But that's, that's, that's how it happened. So, so he, he got this, this statue. Uh, his name was Jim Castle. He's an Emmy Award-winning director. And he shipped it to me so that when I got back to North Carolina, it was there. So this giant box came in. We opened the box. It was full of all these little 
foam peanuts, you know. I mean, it was, it was, it was, this was, it, it's a very awkward thing to ship. Uh, covered with a bunch of uh, New Orleans Mardi Gras beads. Apparently, that was something that people, <laughs> I don't know. Well, I, I'm not even exactly sure how, why he has all those beads. Um, so I figured, okay, I got this really cool statue. I'm going to uh, have a like a media day and invite all the you know, all the local press, you know, to come and see this statue. And so I put him in the museum, and I built this big display around him, and I got all these lights and signs, and Art signed him. Art got down on his hands and knees and signed the base, and we, we had pictures of him signing it. And, I mean, like, he, 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 he hand-wrote a whole letter with the provenance of this thing. I mean, Art really went way above and beyond in order to establish the history of this thing. So, 11 o'clock at night, I'm by myself in the museum, and I, I, I climbed up uh, on a ladder, and I was positioning a sign, and, uh, and then I climbed down, and I looked at him, and I was like, ah, perfect. I, I mean, I really aligned everything perfectly. I left. I went home. I had a meeting early the next day. I had security, uh, I, I didn't have cameras at that time, but I had everything, you know, I had locks and uh, motion sensors and everything on the doors. And uh, so anyway, the next morning I came back, I popped in there to pick up some papers, and I was immediately ticked off because this entire four-foot-tall, 100-pound statue had shifted a good 25 degrees to its right. Wow. And I immediately thought, somebody is coming here and is messing with me. I put all this effort into straightening this thing out. And um, so, you know, I straightened it back, and then I realized after that, nothing else was disturbed. I looked at the security logs. Nobody had come or gone, and I said, wow, this is, wow. This is freaky. And uh, I put a camera on him 24-7. I never captured anything, but I will tell you this, JV. When I was on that ladder next to him the night before, I was in a very vulnerable position. He's got his wooden hand out, and I thought to myself, <laughs> I'm glad that hand didn't close. So um, I know we got kind of off track there, uh, but that's he's going to be there at night number one. Uh, do, do you want to take a break, or do you want to keep no, going? No, let's keep going. Let's keep going. Okay. So... That it's worth coming there just to hang out with with me and, and Carvel. Doctor Mulder is going to be there. Doctor Mulder is the wishing machine master. He's the guy who makes these things. We've been friends for ten years. He, I mean, he is the undisputed. He is the wishing machine master. And then the next day on Saturday, first off, we're all going to get together. And I'm going to give you this this program personally where I go over, like, here is what you do to find out who you are. And then after that, we're going to have an interactive workshop. And I'm going to have everything you can imagine, there, crystal balls and pendulums and pinwheels and wishing machines. We're going to have all this there, and you get to try out all these experiments, do all this stuff. Then I'm going to do a special program about organ technology, bioenergy, the the truth about chakras and uh you know like all all, all this kind of um cloud busting and weather manipulation stuff uh we're going to have a nice dinner and then and then I'm going to produce the creepy vegas ghost and ufo show that I mentioned and I have a brand new thing it's a box um and when you open this box it's got a head in it, okay? It's got a real human head in it. Mm. And uh, I call it the Bell Witch, and I don't want to go into too much detail because it's a sensitive subject. Do you know the story behind the Bell Witch? Yeah, all the, uh, yeah I sure do. Yeah, uh, Tennessee or Kentucky? We're I'm trying to remember. Tennessee. Tennessee, right. Tennessee. Okay. Around Adams, Tennessee, um, and 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 we have a bunch. Like everybody gets a goodie bag, so I know this is like. You know, thank you for allowing me a big commercial for this event. But 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 basically, the the thing is, I really am investing myself one hundred and ten percent in this. And anybody who wants to go, 
uh, can get a discount right now if they go to youwillmanifest.com, youwillmanifest.com. So thank you for letting me tell everybody about it. But um, you can see why that when people do stuff like this, it they form lifelong relationships. Uh, they have life-altering experiences. They gain fortunes. Uh, I tell everybody how to go gamble. I give everybody gambling tips. Um, most people go and they say, I paid for my trip. I, <laughs> I won it in the, in, in the casino. So, hey, maybe you can be there, right? I mean, is that possible, J.D.? Uh, maybe. Uh, you're looking at the end of May here. That's very possible. Sure, I'd love this. Sounds like a great time. It's going to be the best time. If, if you're into this, like anybody who would listen to your show or listen to my podcast, they are going to be in heaven. I'm telling you. If you if you're into this stuff at all, you're going to be in heaven. So yeah, youwillmanifest.com gives you all the information. And that's May 29th and 30th in Las Vegas. Yeah, yeah, that's right. And when I did my event in 2018, I did it on the Strip. I did the I did a huge thing. We went all out and we did it at the MGM Excalibur. This time I decided not to do it on the Strip because. Every time you go and buy a drink, it's like fifteen bucks. You know, yeah, yeah. everything is so expensive on the strip. And also, I had to sign a deal where I had a room block, and you had to stay there at the Excalibur. So there were people who contacted me and said, "Well, I live here in Vegas. I don't want to get a, a hotel room. Sorry, you got to get a hotel room." Yeah. And then you know, you know. So this time, I've I've arranged it to be more fluid. Like you, you can stay wherever you want. Um, you, I mean, like, basically, you're going to be able to pay, like, normal prices for drinks and stuff like that, and you get included all kinds of, of goodies and meals and things, so, it's, it, I've learned from being here, uh, the past couple of years, and I've been traveling to Vegas for 15 years, but I've learned from being here most of the time the past two years how to do this and save everybody money and make it like a, a great value. So I remember going to Vegas. Um, I can't even do the math now, but uh, early nineties, I guess. And uh, even the strip, everything was cheap. I mean, you could get, you know, great meals yeah. and, and drinks and everything because the, the casinos wanted your business. They wanted you in your, in their, uh, in their facility. And that kind of, that's changed over the years. Let's pull it, pull it all back together here, Josh. We've talked about a lot tonight, uh, a lot of great stuff, but, um, where, do, where does all this stand in your mind? Let's talk about the technology, the invisibility cloaking, the camouflage stuff. Are you going to continue to do more experience experiments with this? Oh, yeah. I mean, I have already been doing more experiments, but, you know, uh, to be honest with you, it's a little bit frustrating because, as we were talking about earlier, I mean, sometimes you think to yourself, this is stuff that should not be released. Um, you know, I, I mentioned that at the event that I'm going to do, I'm going to talk about uh, Oregon and some of the success that I've had with cloud busting over the past 25 years. And I use cloud busting all the time for events. Uh, anybody who comes to my uh, events, and I don't do that many of them, but I think they can always tell you the, the weather's nice. And um, so I have thought to myself, well, what if you teach everybody how to manipulate the weather and then everybody manipulates the weather according to his or her own schedule or agenda. Well, now you have chaos, right? Right. So, so some of these things, I mean, you have to be very, very particular about. Um, and so, you know, that's that that that's kind of where I am when it comes to the the, the invisibility stuff. Do we have I mean, to you, worry. You've got to be really careful. Yeah, you mentioned you mentioned how, what happens if this technology gets into the wrong hands. Imagine what's yeah. possible. Do you um do you fear that? I mean, obviously, in a greater sense, you would. But do you think that anything like that is imminent? Oh yeah, oh yeah, it, it, it's inevitable. Um, I, I I just hope that. You know, you're 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 more petty thieves who who would benefit from this sort of thing most are probably not the type of people who pay attention to what you and I are doing. Um, I mean, but as far as governments are concerned, yeah, oh, damn right. you, <laughs> you 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 could have a whole fleet uh, over over top of your house right now and and not know it. I mean, it, I th there aren't too many people out there who 
can talk about invisibility because, again, it's a very easy way to make yourself sound insane. Uh, it's kind of like, um, well, you have people who say, uh, well, the UFOs disguise themselves to look like helicopters and airplanes. And because, you know, if you see a helicopter or an airplane in this country, on the right wing of an airplane, it's got a green light. And on the left wing, it has a red light. And then there's a strobe. And you think to yourself, well, that would be a really easy way for a UFO to disguise itself. Uh, that'd be way easier than using some kind of <laughs> invisibility yeah. tech. But, but if you talk about that, well, you, you sound nuts. So, so how do you discuss that reality, going back to camouflage and, and, and invisibility? How do you discuss the, the, the reality that I could have something there that is completely exotic, but as long as I have the, the, blink, the blinking strobe and the, the green light and the red light, you're just going to say, oh, it, it's an aircraft. Uh, it's quite a conundrum, isn't it? Yeah, yeah, absolutely. We have um, just a few minutes left. Uh, I, uh, one of the things that I, I love about your work, Josh, is that you you do a great job of uh, kind of exploring the, the the deep dark recesses of what we do here, and then bringing it all together into the center where it starts to make sense. Will you be able to apply any of the any of these experiments that you're doing as you continue to uh, study and research and understand this invisibility cloaking or camouflage or however you want to put it, and uh, start reaching into these other areas like uh, ghostly apparitions or Bigfoot, if you will, and start putting you know those pieces together, maybe creating the links of those chains? Yes. So here is how all this ties together. As I mentioned before, everything that humans are able to perceive, as far as we know, is a, is a pulse. It's a pulsation of either pressure or electromagnetic energy. Uh, you can break it down that simply. And what you find is that it's all the same stuff. Who knows? We might even be able to break it all down to just electromagnetism, frankly, because that also might create pressure. But the point is, it's all the same. Radio waves, microwaves, infrared, the visible spectrum, X-rays, you know, uh, ultraviolet, uh, alpha, beta, gamma. It, it's all the same thing. It's just pulsing at a different rate. So you can take something that you understand at one point in that spectrum, and you can scale it to any other point in that spectrum. So if I'm able to take this material that I have, I'm looking at it right now, that can make something invisible to me as a human, and I can scale that up or down, high or low, then what I am demonstrating is that it's very, very easy for us to at least admit that we are possibly, you know, potentially immersed within an invisible world. I'm not going to say that I know all the dimensions and all the dynamics, because, you know, how could I? But... Right. If you say, I can make this little thing invisible, and you can scale that to show that other things can be invisible, well, then what we're saying is that it's time for us to all open our minds and to say, whether we're talking about ghosts or cryptids or psychic phenomena, interdimensional beings, we are only able to perceive a tiny slice of a huge, huge world that is mainly invisible to us. We get glimpses sometimes, we get shadows, we get little little peaks through the ripples. But you can you can take whatever angle you want, whatever interests you, and you can approach it there. You can you you can start there, but at the end of the day what you're gonna find is we have to open the human mind to the fact that 
we are only able to see a small little fraction of this massive, amazing world of potential that is all around us. It's a great point, Josh. Great point. Um, Once again, let people know where they can get information about the event, your books, and anything else you've got going on. Well, my website is joshuapwarren.com, no period after the P. If you go to joshuapwarren.com and click around, you can find a lot of wild stuff. Go to the Gallery of the Strange. Sign up for my free e-newsletter. It takes you two seconds. You'll get uh, what I consider a free good luck charm that's instantly sent to you. It's a digital good luck charm. You know, you'll see my podcast there, Joshua P. Warren Daily, always short free, commercial-free, independent, uncensored. And the Curiosity Shop has got things you will not find anywhere else. But I hope that I will get to meet you and hang out with you in person. And to me, it's really important when people come to an event, and I don't do many events, when people come to an event with me, I sit down with you and I talk to you and we have conversations and we do experiments. And maybe you can just tell from listening to me on on JV's show and other shows, I mean, like, you know, I I don't like it when you have all these, like, flaky, superficial people. I I sit down and I really listen to you, and, and we have good, serious conversations. And so if you want to come meet with me, well, why wouldn't you want to come and hang out in Las Vegas for a couple of nights? Go to youwillmanifest.com, youwillmanifest.com. And uh, I only have 99 tickets available, but if you go right now, there's a discount. And, JV, I want to congratulate you on uh, all of your success over the years and, you know, keeping this audience entertained. It's not an easy thing to do, so that says a lot about your talent. And uh, it's always just a huge pleasure and joy to be on your show. So thank you. Well, I appreciate that, but I also think uh, any success I've had comes from the value of the guests like you, Josh. So I appreciate you being here tonight. Um, That's going to do it. Again, Josh, thanks so much for being here. I know it was kind of a last-minute thing, but, man, it was entertaining and informative, as it always is when you're on the program. And please agree to come back soon. Beyond Reality Paranormal is hosted by J.V. Johnson and produced by Orion Palmer and Slick Eddie Edwards. Like us on Facebook and subscribe to our YouTube channel. Please consider supporting the program either through your podcast platform, click on the link in the description, or on Patreon at Joha Productions. If you'd like to be a guest on Beyond Reality Paranormal or you have a recommendation for a guest, contact our producer, Slick Eddie Edwards. Eddie is spelled with a Y at slickeddieedwards at gmail.com.